Nope. Why am I recording these? Why am I recording these? <laughs> oh yes, somebody did. Okay. So no, we keep recording them because there's going to be days and already have been days where my kids are loud and I can't hear it. So I might go back and watch it again later. Okay. Then I will keep recording. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so uh, what, was I, what was I talking about? Oh yeah. I will record these and post them on YouTube um, with no editing. Okay. Uh, anyway, I'm glad that a bunch of you showed up because um, I've been thinking about this and like it really, you know, everything's pretty weird right now. The world is like upside down. Um, and like coming here and being in Zoom with you all and talking about art for an hour is like, I don't know, it's like a meditation. It's like a break where like the world doesn't exist anymore for a whole hour and like I could just think about art with you. So thank you for showing up. Uh, okay, so let's, um, if nobody has any questions, let's um, continue our discussion of early Chinese art. And I think we left off at the end of last class with the discussion of the funerary banner of the Lady Dai. So this um, wealthy family um, during the Han Dynasty was uh, buried in a really elaborate um, entombment. This is from the second century BCE, also known as a long ass time ago. Um, and from the Han period, um, so we're still in that time period when like most of the things that we're seeing in terms of artistic production or what we would call art are things, objects that are found in tombs. Um, so what kinds of things are we finding in these tombs? Um, and not, not me personally, archeologists. Um, archeologists have found um, elaborate burials. So this burial that we looked at last class of Lady Di is quite elaborate with this um, really elaborately painted um, silk funerary banner and also ceramic objects. Um, so the image that you see on the left is uh, a ceramic model. It's, I don't know, three or four feet tall. I'm not really good with sizes. You, you remember that about me. Um, and uh, it's ceramic that's then painted uh, and you can get a sense of like what uh, Han dynasty period house would have looked like from these ceramic objects. And we see cultures doing this in other parts of the world as well. Um, if you've taken uh, Mexican art history, you'll remember uh, from the West Mexican shaft tombs, the um, small house models that were found in burials. Uh, so it's a pretty typical thing to see in ancient tombs, models of houses. Um, you'll see that in terms of the design of the house, it's uh, quite uh, vertical. And we'll talk uh, in a minute after I talk about the funerary banner, a little bit about uh, early uh, Chinese building methods. Okay, so let's look uh, a little bit closer at the funerary banner. I know we looked at it last class, but I kind of rushed through it. So I just want to look at it again. Uh, it's made out of silk. And I think I mentioned in last class that silk is a luxury item that uh, the process of, you know, collecting the worm and like the worm has to eat a specific kind of leaf. Do I remember which kind? Mulberry, the worm has to eat mulberry leaves. Um, and then it's, you know, builds this cocoon and it's, you know, preparing to itself to become a moth, but then um, before they, it's hatched, before it becomes a moth, um, the cocoon is steamed. And so the thread is created out of this cocoon um, and then it's woven into a fabric. So it's a really quite elaborate process to produce this. And if you've ever touched silk, you know it's really soft and nice to touch. Uh, and so of course, because it is this elaborate process, it means it's a luxury item. So regular everyday people were not wearing these beautiful silk uh, fabrics um, and we're not buried with silk fabrics either. So this is uh, a burial from a high status elite family. There are three tombs. It was discovered in uh, the late 20th century. So not that long ago by our standards in the 1970s, um, not that long ago in terms of archeology. span And you can see that there are three uh, coffins that are very elaborately decorated. Um, and some of them are in better shape than others. So there's the, the, the husband and the wife, and I think one of their um, children's 
Um, the, the, oh yeah, their son is buried in there too. So um, his tomb is not in good uh, condition, but her tomb, the wife, um, was in really, really good condition. You're looking now on the screen at an image of um, an artist's rendering of the burial. So you can see that the body was laid inside and then there is like a series of coffins uh, built around the body. And apparently like the, the body was well preserved. It's sort of like this kind of soft mummy, sort of like those uh, beef jerky looking saints in European Catholic churches. Um, okay, so Anyway, we looked at the funerary banner itself. So the tomb itself, like the coffin itself is quite elaborately decorated with animals uh, and perhaps some mythological figures. And then the funerary banner itself. So this silk fabric is something that would sort of lay over the coffin um, and is reminiscent of the kind of clothing, the silk fabric that's, that and a, a person of this elite status like Lady Di would actually wear in real life when she was alive. Uh, so it's this really uh, precious material, a luxury material, an expensive material. And then the entire fabric is painted, hand painted, and it's quite large. You can see the measurements, it's six feet, nine inches. So it's almost seven feet long. So it would be hanging over this coffin. Uh, and it's um, quite elaborately decorated. So we looked at, some close-ups of this painted silk banner and we saw that this is sort of broken up into registers. Um, so in this kind of top area, the top register, we have the heavenly realm. In the central area, we see Lady Di and her attendants in the worldly realm, the earthly realm. And then toward the bottom, um, there's an image of uh, the funerary rituals and below that, the underworld. So let me show you some close-ups from this funerary banner. Uh, in the top, in the top register, the heavenly realm, uh, we see these kind of mythological figures depicted that recall Taoist mythology. Um, so there's one myth from the Han Dynasty of you know a hunter who saves the day by shooting a bird that had been blocking the sun. Uh, so we see uh, this kind of sun with a raven in front of it. And then there's a moon. What's on the moon? I can't see it. Let me move this thing. It's like a little toad. Yeah, there's like a dancing, a toad dancing on the moon, um, this raven blocking the sun. And then what are these figures? Dragons. Dragons, dragons. Um, so you can see dragons, which again, we, we know already from last class that dragons are associated with uh, royalty uh, and also with the heavens. And I think, who was it last class that said, was it Noemi no, that said something about dragons and fog? What was it? Oh yeah, that- Yeah, that it was, was me. <laughs> what did you say again? Tell me again, it was, it was brilliant. <laughs> I said it'd be funny if they thought that dragons were something that was um, emanated from the fog that was on top of like rivers or waters and how yeah. the water would dissipate and would look like, you know, like swirls. Right. So watching yeah. fog dissipate and then seeing like the shape of the dragon in there. Um, so we know that dragons are associated with clouds, um, water and rain, and they're thought of as creatures that can um, swim and enter the water, but also fly in the sky. So they're really important in not just early Chinese art, but throughout Chinese art history, you'll see uh, dragons figure prominently. Um, and they all, dragons are also really uh, popular in Vietnamese art, and this is something that's brought in um, via China. So we see this kind of um, depiction of the heavenly realm. Uh, there's also, uh, there are also these two figures that sort of guard uh, also like maybe like guardians of the, the gateway into the heavens, something like that. There are other things that are going on that I don't know what they are. Like, do you see this thing in the center? Like, I'm not sure what this is. I don't know if this is some kind of vessel. Um, this tall stack thing kind of reminds me of those, of the, that carved 
jade that we were looking at last week, but I'm really not sure what some of these things are. I mean, some of these are obviously animals. You can see some birds, you can see some human-like figures riding horses. Um, there also appears to be somebody riding this dragon's wing. Oh, it's Daenerys. Um, and then there's this large figure at the top. Uh, and we're not sure who this is, but it could be um, a deity. And it's kind of unclear if this is a, a, a deity or a human. Like, is this a human sort of resting on some kind of snake or dragon-like body? Or is this all one figure? And it's, it's sort of unclear. Um, this could be a depiction of the deceased husband, maybe? It's, it's really not clear, but we do know that um, it, this might be something that would be typical because the deceased is also depicted in the image um, below. So it could make sense that the husband would also be included. Oh, good. I have a really nice close up here. So I think you can see all of the details and you can see some of the kind of um, swirling, curving, organic lines that are really quite elegantly drawn, these curving, curvilinear shapes, the twisting uh, and like rhythmic forms are, are really quite elegant. In the, oh, does anybody have a question? I was gonna say, could the thing in the middle be kind of like a crest or like a seal of the family? It could be this thing right here. Yeah, because I mean, it's like the central kind of like figure there with everything around it. So I think that would kind of play into it. It could uh, be. This almost looks like they're burning incense or something. Like it looks, I don't know, to me this looks like a, like a little holding bowl, right? Like it would yeah. have like a something like a chalice or huh. like a kind of offering of a, a rice wine or burning something. Um, and then, and it seems to be like on some kind of stand, but I don't know if I'm reading this sort of, these sort of shadowy areas as if they're flames or smoke. Yeah, Crystal says they look like smoke. Yeah. This, is, this is sort of how it looks to me, but I don't really know. And then there are these, these look like little ties, almost like, like a hat that you would tie on, like with straps or something. Like I don't oh, wouldn't it palette. be like the little thing that's like on top of the buns of the people below? Because they have that little like, like this kind of some some kind of hat. Yeah, yeah. Because don't those look like ribbons? Do you see that? Where, can you see my arrow? Yeah. Mm -hmm. those I, that's why I thought it would be like a crest, like in a way, because it doesn't look like it would be a stand with the ribbons. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, I couldn't really stand. Yeah, maybe some kind of ha headdress or hat. And that sim this thing on top would indicate the family. You know, I don't. I don't know. This could. This could be. This could be a research topic. <laughs> you could for your project. You could find out what that is, and then when you find out what it is, if it is some kind of hat or headdress, you could tell us everything about the hats. Like this is one possible um, project topic idea. So this is how. Uh, and I'm getting off topic, but this is how detailed your projects can be like you can just find one little image in one artwork and just deep dive into it yeah um okay i think it might be some kind of headdress yeah and i think that's a smart idea that it's indicating something about the family let's say that's a good idea okay um so and we as we move down and so i just want to draw your attention to where so this is the heavenly realm and we have sort of this kind of fanciful gate and these two guardian figures who appear to be guarding the entrance into the heavenly realm um, where dr these dragons and animals live up in the skies. And then down below we have the earthly realm. So let me show you the close up that I have of the earthly realm. Um, here you can see uh, a depiction of Lady Di. We assume that this is Lady Di and we see um, that she is depicted as larger than the other figures. So this is an example of hierarchy of scale. This is something that we see, especially in ancient art um, worldwide, that like when people started making images, 
um, they had to think about ways like how can I transmit information through an image, right? Um, and one way to indicate that one figure is more important than the others is to use hierarchy of scale. So this figure is larger than the other figures and therefore um, seen as more symbolically represented as more important. Um, and this would be based on these Confucian ideas, right? Um, of obedience to uh, people above you sort of on this social hierarchy. Uh, you also see that the figures, so Lady Di and her attendants and then um, this kind of, they're standing on this sort of, I don't know what it is, like a platform or something. Um, and this is an example of um, a, a ground line. So like they're really um, anchoring, the artist is anchoring these figures in real space. They're not just sort of floating up in the heavens or in the skies, um, but they're actually like standing on a ground line. So this hierarchy of scale um, and the ground line, like both of these are like, you know, advancements in the arts at this point in China. Like these are like novel things to do in the arts. You can see that like the, the whole kind of structure surrounding them looks like another big giant dragon and there are sort of swirling lines that might represent um, clouds or water around the figures. And then, uh, and, and then I said, I mentioned this last week that we think that this is a depiction of the deceased of Lady Di. And if this is true, then this would be the earliest example of a painted portrait in China. So, you know, if this is true. Uh, oh, I have nice close up of, of this central area. And so you can see, and I think this is like um, maybe art inception. Like it looks like she's wearing a fabric that might be the fabric that we're looking at. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's kind of like, I don't know if you've ever studied European art and you've seen like, you know, Diego Velasquez um, making a painting of himself. So he, he's seeing himself making a painting in the painting. I think that this, if you look at these, the kind of red and blue swirls on the, this silk fabric that she's wearing. And then you look at the silk fabric itself and you see these red and blue swirls. It might be that she's actually wearing like what is what this image is painted on. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, oh, and look, they look, they have this kind of hat thing on with the ribbons. Do you see that? Yeah, those look similar to the ribbons on the bottom of the like bowl. Yeah, I think that's, I think that might be what it is. I think it might be a headdress. Oh, I love that. Okay. Uh, all right. So this is the earthly realm. So we see sort of like a reinforcement of Confucian ideals um, about sort of like hierarchy and obedience and, um, you know, the distribution of power. And then um, below this, so really still in the earthly realm, below this, we see a, a depiction of the funerary practices, um, the typical funerary practices of the time. So this is like quite interesting and I don't think I have a better image of this. Unfortunately, I don't. Um, but we can see sort of like a table with some vessels and we see several figures seated around here. Um, you know, performing some kind of Confucian ritual um, related to the funeral of Lady Di. Uh, so you know, again, these Confucian ideas of sort of respecting your elders and, um, you know, honoring your ancestors and following the, you know, agreed upon hierarchy of society is really depicted here um, in the earthly realm. And you can also see in the foreground, so there's something else that's really interesting with this is like the artist is really attempting to create a sense of space. Uh, so just like with the ground line above us where we have Lady Di and her attendants standing like rooted on the earth, not just floating around in space. Um, we also see like a kind of roof structure, an element that indicates a, a sense of structure or space, like a building that we're in or next to. Uh, and then also um, these, uh, ceram these look like ceramic objects. And then these ones with the legs look like bronze bowls. 
Um, and all of these uh, like are in the foreground uh, and then behind them. So the figures are overlapping. There's figures and the figures are overlapping and then there's the, the like ceramic, the pottery and the bronze object are in front. So they're, pla they're overlapping and placed on top, but this makes it look like the figures are behind and um, they're in the middle ground and then the pottery is in the foreground. So the artist is really creating a, a quite an interesting de depiction of space, right? A de depiction of three-dimensional space. Um, and we also get a little bit of a sense of what uh, a funeral ritual might look like at the time. There would be some, uh, probably some words spoken, some chants, uh, and then these bronze bowls, um, they're not really bowls, they're almost, it's almost like a a cauldron, like a bronze cauldron. Uh, and I don't think I have any in the PowerPoint, but um, they're pretty typical. They're found in early ancient, um, ancient Chinese tombs, these bronze cauldrons that would have been used for like rice wine or something that would be used at the funeral. And then the cauldron would be buried uh, with the deceased. So we can see um, this object depicted in the painting and then also they have found these in tombs. And some of them are small like bowls and some of them are really quite large bronze cauldrons. Um, and they're usually decorated and, and possibly have writing on them. With the like use of space, you can also see the attempt at a central vanishing point. If you look at kind of like the table in the back in between the two middle pots, you can see that's kind of like the, where the line is going to create that kind of like depth or attempt yeah. at that. Yeah, like the way the figures are placed, there's this, yeah. yeah, there's there's this sort of use of linear perspective, or at least the overlapping of the figures um, to create that sense of three-dimensionality. Yeah, so this is, like, I want us to look at the iconography, but also think about, like, what kinds of innovations these artists are making. Like, they're really figuring out, like, how to create an image from reality and like put it onto a flat surface. So sometimes we, uh, and I do this too, like sometimes I get too caught up in the iconography and like forget to look at the style and the, you know, stylistic um, techniques. Okay. Uh, okay, so we talked about the illusion of space and then below this, and then the, they're also on a platform. So this is creating a ground line. And then below this is a depiction of the underworld. And unfortunately, uh, I don't have a, a better close up of the underworld. Um, no, I don't. Um, but you can kind of get a sense of like, you see this large sort of snake dragon figure, this kind of deity um, that appears to be holding up this floor. So this is the floor where the funeral is happening. There's that like triangle like roof thing right there. Um, and then there's this sort of, um, there's some like fish that kind of swim across and form this circle beneath this deity that seems to be holding up the funeral. So there seems to be maybe this connection between um, some of the mythological ideas and Confucian rituals that like the mythology is supporting the rituals like literally in the painting. Um, and these beings, uh, the fish, probably some kind of symbol of water and then the other being which it's not really clear what kind of creature it is but could symbolize earth these sort of opposing or balancing forces in Taoist philosophy. So we, we talked about Taoism and we talked about Confucianism. So um, I'm going to assume that you know what those are. Okay. Uh, okay, so uh, inside the tomb, they found all sorts of other really interesting things. Um, cushions, armrests, clothing, uh, a walking stick. And I think, is she depicted with a stick? Yeah, check this out. See this like walking stick right here that she's holding? She's also buried with a walking stick. So I don't know, I think like if you look at the imagery on this um, and you see the walking stick and you know that the walking stick is buried with her, like I really think that this is a depiction of the banner itself. I love art inceptions like that. Um, so all of these things that she would need, you know, the, um, the 
silverware and bowls and things that she would need to eat in the after loop, afterlife. <laughs> All of this um, is buried with her in uh, her tomb. And, you know, this is a pretty typical for elite individuals to have this kind of elaborate tomb. Um, and this is how we can learn a little bit about life and art during the Han Dynasty. Uh, here's a close-up image of that model house. So this was not found in the same burial, but it was found in another Han Dynasty period burial. So this is from the first century CE, so it's a few hundred years later. Uh, and you can see that it's ceramic that's been painted. It's earthenware, which means it's low fired, not high fired, like um, stoneware, uh, and then it's painted, not glazed. Um, and luckily, it's been found in really good condition, and you can see really elaborate, ornate designs, curving organic designs, um, and geometric, abstracted geometric designs painted on the house. You also see a little model figure as well, who's sort of looking down from this balcony. Uh, so it gives us a little bit of an idea of what Han period uh, Chinese architecture would have looked like. And most of these houses um, were probably made out of wood, which is why they haven't survived. So this is pretty typical of ancient people um, to have houses built of wood. Um, and these, of course, would not survive. The building itself like, is quite vertical. Um, and then each floor, like each level or floor, would be kind of like what we would call an open floor plan, and that the rooms would be uh, separated with some kind of divider, right? Like a folding screen would separate and make different rooms. Uh, but otherwise, we don't have uh, much of a sense of what the interiors would look like. But we do have a little bit of a sense of um, how the structures would be built and sort of like um, typical, you know, Chinese um, construction methods. Um, so the typical construction method in ancient China is raised beam construction. So um, the, there, the walls, there aren't really walls. Like, okay, there, there are walls, there will be walls. But the walls do not have load bearing function like our walls in our houses do, right? Instead, you can see in this um, drawing, there are posts, um, wood posts that uh, hold up lintels. And you can see that the lintels um, are stacked and then the lintels hold up the roof. So the walls are not necessary. So walls might be added later, um, you know, to kind of close off the house um, to regulate temperature, but the walls would not have um, been load bearing. Instead, these it's a post and lintel system. And this is like the really, really ancient way of like, um, you know, building a structure. Like we'll think back to Stonehenge, like you just put two stones this way and you put another stone across and you've got a doorway, right? And that's like the basic unit of architecture. We'll see um, by the Tang Dynasty and in the later periods, um, we'll see this um, curved rafter um, and eave, which becomes like pretty iconic and helps you, I think, to recognize Chinese architecture like sort of immediately um, when, you, when you see that curved sloping roof. It's very characteristic of Chinese architecture. Okay, um, and of course, uh, I think I told you to look at this last, at the end of last class, we will look at Chinese calligraphy, which is uh, definitely related to writing, like, and literature and poetry, but it's also a visual art, right? Um, and there's a whole sort of structure to the the art of calligraphy. Uh, there's the scholar's desk. Um, there are different sizes of brushes, different kinds of inks, different kinds of paper. Um, and there's a whole sort of art form to the act of creating uh, calligraphy. Uh, the oldest writing in China does not exist in the form of calligraphy. The oldest writing in China um, we find on ox bones um, from the really ancient period. Um, calligraphy emerges later in the imperial period. Um, and we'll start to see that like calligraphy and the development of literature and poetry and landscape painting are all tied together. Uh, 
And there are different uh, styles of calligraphy. So I think if, um, if anybody did the calligraphy assignment, you would have seen these different styles, right? Seal style, which is like the earliest form of writing. So it's like very basic. Clerical, which is a little, it's got some more curved, um, almost like cursive. You can write quicker if you use clerical. Um, and this is used historically for like clerks who are recording things like writing receipts and things like this. Um, the standard calligraphy style is like what is like standardized and used today for like printing books and making signs on businesses and whatnot. Um, and then there are two, semi-cursive and cursive, which are these more like artistic flourishing kinds of calligraphy. So I'll actually show you a video that will demonstrate the different styles. And the video is made by the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco. So you can see all the different tools. They have to, um, this is the grinding stone and they grind the ink on the stone. It's almost like a pictograph at this point, like really basic. This is like cursive writing, you know, it's a little looser. is a little bit slower um, which is why we like the more standardized script is a little bit looser and flowier because it can be written more quickly Okay, um, and I'm going to show you one more video, um, also produced by the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco, just to show you him writing a, a poem in cursive script. There's even like a special way to hold the brush. And I know that like for us, we sort of make a distinction between um, writing and art form, like writing and visual arts as if they're sort of like two separate things. But as you'll see when we look at Chinese scroll painting, um, 
calligraphy and painting uh, really go together. Poetry, uh, writing, landscape painting, and like literature all meld into one in Chinese art. Uh, and the, these distinctions that we have in the West don't really exist. Like these are all like sort of part of one art form. Um, and you'll see that like, you know, text is uh, integrated into image like rather seamlessly. Um, and many times both the text and the image refer to some Taoist ideas. So this one that we just looked at, um, this poem is like quite a simple poem. Um, you know, it's about sort of climbing up a tower and looking out at the view and looking at the river like flowing toward the sea like it's you know kind of sounds banal or like not much is going on but it's asking us to slow down and be in the moment and get in touch with nature and be a present and aware which are some of these Taoist ideas that we talked about um, a few weeks ago when we saw each other in real life. Um, someone says, sort of like illuminated manuscripts, sort of like illuminated manuscripts. Um, sort of like, yes, like illuminated manuscripts in that the text and the image are integrated. Yes, very much so. Okay. So I'm going to open the next slideshow. So just for your reference, we are moving on to um, slideshow number two. So if you want to uh, just, you know, keep that in mind when you're studying or looking back at this, we're moving on to um, slideshow number two, so that we can start to talk about um, the introduction of Buddhism into China and how um, that is reflected in the arts. And then we'll look at golden age art of China. So art from the golden age. Uh, and then when we come next week is spring break, friendly reminder. And then when we come back, we'll talk about modern and contemporary art. So whatever we don't get through, you're going to have to review on your own. Cool. Okay. Um, so as we move forward, we're in the, you know, common era now. So just to give you kind of a sense of time, um, we're talking about the end of the Roman Empire in the West, the beginning of the spread of Christianity in Europe. Um, this time period around 220 to 580, 581 common era um, is known as the period of disunity. So it's a period where there's lots of change and tumultuous chaos going on. You remember the Silk Road, you know that um, China is connected to Europe through this road and ideas and products are brought back and forth between East and West um, during this time. Um, and along the Silk Road, um, Buddhist monks bring uh, Buddhism to China from India. And of course, we'll see artistic influences, especially in the very early period from Indian art, but soon um, Chinese art develops um, in its own style. Uh, and Buddhism comes to a country, comes to China at a time when there are already two like coexisting systems of thought philosophy in place. Confucianism, which is a way to sort of organize society, and Taoism, um, which, you know, really has um, deep, deep roots in China uh, and really affect how people like live their day to day lives and find meaning. Um, and so um, Buddhism does come to China, but it doesn't replace these, right? Confucianism and Taoism still, even today, remain really, really important and have a really profound effect on religion, um, philosophy, politics, like even in contemporary China. Um, okay, so um, we will look at um, one example of um, this ch early Chinese Buddhist sculpture, the Zhao Buddha, um, the earliest dated Chinese image of the Buddha. There might be one that's earlier, um, but it can't be accurately dated. Um, and then we'll look briefly at the six canons of painting and we'll look a little bit more about like at painting and calligraphy and how um, literature and poetry and the visual arts are really combined um, through painting. 
guess I have another video for you. The Asian Art Museum in San Francisco um, has made some really useful videos on Asian art. I think we'll look at the Buddha sculpture here. Yes. Can you hear it okay? Yeah. Okay. This Buddha has a unique status amongst Buddhas in China. Michael Knight, senior curator of Chinese art. It has an inscription on the back that is equivalent to 338. And that is the earliest date inscribed on any Buddhist sculpture from China, not just in our museum, but anywhere in the world. And the fact that it is the earliest date of the Buddha and such a large one for the period is a masterpiece, no question. While the sculpture itself is almost completely intact, there are some elements missing. If you can kind of peek around to the back, you will see sticking out of the back of the head, there's a square protrusion with a round hole in the middle. It suggests that something was once attached to the back of the Buddha, most likely an umbrella. So as you look at this piece, you have to imagine there would have been a shaft going up with an umbrella on the top of that shaft and then hanging from the outside edge of that umbrella would have been a series of bangles. Also on the front, if you look at it closely, there are three holes. Yeah. And those three holes most likely would have supported a pair of guardian lions on either side. And then in the center, a lotus. And the Buddha was completely covered in gold, except for the head, which was probably painted dark blue or black. It was Buddhist missionary monks from Central Asia who brought images of the Buddha to China. Okay, great. So, so this uh, sculpture, which you can see if, if museums ever open again and we can travel ever again, you can go up to San Francisco. I'm joking, it will, don't worry, we will. They'll, they'll, have, a, they'll have a vaccine um, in a year. <laughs> so at least by then, but I feel like stuff will open up again. Um, They'll, they'll probably have to be limits on like how many people can be in a place, but I think stuff will open up again in a few months. So someday you can go up to San Francisco and you can see this in real life. So this is gilt bronze. So that it's a bronze sculpture that's then covered in gold. So you might see gilt or gilded. Both of these mean covered in gold. Um, and it is, as they mentioned in the video, the earliest dated Buddhist um, sculpture in China. So this is probably, um, we don't know exactly if it's, um, you know, made by Chinese artists or if it might be made by um, an artist who was traveling with somebody along the Silk Road with these monks um, who brought Buddhism to China. Um, but it's, um, this bronze sculpture of a seated Buddha. You can see he's seated in the lotus position uh, and then with the eyes kind of downcast in a meditative uh, pose. And you can see these holes on the front uh, where there would have been, as you saw in the video, um, two lions and a lotus flower. Remember that the lotus flower is associated with enlightenment and the lions are associated with Buddhist imagery in the early period in India, you'll remember, right? Remember the lion pillars from Ashoke, the, the lion roaring the message of the Buddha around India. Um, we also see lion imagery at early Indian Buddhist sites like this on the Great Stupa at Sanchi. Um, and then there's this thing in the back of the head. So there might, there would have been some kind of umbrella or possibly some kind of halo behind the Buddha. Um, so in terms of like style, uh, it's, it doesn't really present many sort of innovations and kind of shows a debt to Indian art, right? So like if they're making a new, an, an image of the Buddha in China, you know, like there's not much to go on. You're like creating a new image. Um, so they might be, show some influence of Indian art. Um, but I think there are a few stylistic differences. Uh, so do you have any ideas looking at this um, and thinking about what we saw when we studied early uh, Indian Buddha statues? Like, do you see any similarities or differences? 
I was thinking since it's like gilded bronze and you have a lot of the gold, I think that gets attributed to kind of like the Angkor region. Like I know in Thailand, they did a lot of like shiny gold, like busts of the Buddha. And that wasn't seen in like Indian Buddha style, but attributing it back to like the Ganhara style, you can see the hair is really like pronounced and it's not like the tight spirals you see later on. Okay, yeah, really good. So in some ways it resembles the Gandhara style, but um, like like the way the hair is depicted, instead of being those little tight little like knots or knobs, um, it looks like we see like tendrils of hair. And it's not wavy like the Gandhara Buddha's hair, but straight, right? Yeah. Uh, so we have this really like stick straight hair. Um, so the hair is a little bit different, but we do see that it's, you know, perhaps influenced by the Gandhara style. Um, and then you also mentioned the use of gold, which is not typical in Indian Buddhist art, right? But you did mention we see in Southeast Asia, in places like um, Thailand and Vietnam, um, we will see the extensive use of gold. But the fabric tucks too are kind of like Gandhara Buddha. Yeah. Yes. The way the fabric drapes and hangs um, is very similar to the Gandhara style Buddha. So um, we don't see, it, it looks less sort of Indian, like it doesn't look like the Mathra style, um, sort of more Indian looking Buddha. Uh, so we see some influence of Indian style, um, but maybe like, you know, some elements that look more uniquely Chinese. I think they're like, um, facial structure also looks more Chinese than Indian, right? Yeah, in the eyes and in the roundness of the like face. Right. Think, yeah, and then the hair, the straightness, that could be kind of like a locality thing. Mm -hmm. Kind of like bringing in their own like cultural influences. Yes, exactly. So like here the Buddha, like we see the influence of Indian sculpture, but the Buddha mm -hmm. himself is depicted as if he were a Chinese man, more so than an Indian man. Right, based on the, the straight hair, um, the wide face, um, the less round eyes. Uh, okay, really good. Uh, so this is the earliest known, oh look, I had them next to each other so we could look at them next to each other. <laughs> I should have put this up, but let, yeah, look at that. So if you look at the fabric, the way the fabric is depicted uh, on the Gandhara Buddha, like it, it it looks like this artist, the Chinese artist, had maybe seen a Gandhara Buddha um, and then had, had gone on to make a similar one, but then of course depicting the figure looking as looking sort of more Chinese, um, kind of, oops. Um, but if you look at like the way the fabric is depicted, it's almost like they're looking, looking at it and copying it directly. Yeah, the folds, like in the middle of the legs and in the chest, the right? Matter, they look sim really similar. Yeah, the way this drapes, the way the fabric hangs over the arms and this, this bunching up of the fabric in the center. Okay. Um, really good. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about are the cave shrines that are built. So this is when we start to see, so basically what happens with Buddhism in China is this. Um, Buddhism is adopted by rulers, by emperors, um, and it's sort of imposed on uh, Chinese society from like a top-down method, right? Um, so it's not like um, I don't know, I like think of the spread of Christianity in Europe and like Christianity was something that like people started practicing even though it was illegal and then like eventually the rulers came around and everybody knows Constantine like makes Christianity legal, right? In China, it's actually different. Like it's not people who are practicing Buddhism, um, but it's actually like the rulers and emperors who bring it in um, and, and start making art um, depicting, you know, the Buddha, Bodhisattvas, uh, etc. And then sometimes depicting themselves um, even in the artwork. Um, and so they're sort of using Buddhist imagery to reinforce their power. Um, and then it's kind of something that's like brought to Chinese society. So it's kind of an interesting way um, to use the religion, um, which is really different from like how like the historical Buddha Shakyamuni probably would have like 
you know, wanted the, the religion that, you know, is named after him to, you know, take shape. Um, but so what we're going to see is that these elite, these emperors, these rulers start to spend a lot of money to carve Buddhist shrines in caves. Um, and somebody asked me, I think last week, why caves? Like, what's the thing with caves? Um, and I think this is really like coming from the concept of like a Buddhist monk um, or an aesthetic, like going to a cave to meditate, right? And this would be like part of somebody's spiritual or could be part of somebody's spiritual practice, like removing oneself from society, going to a cave for a time period um, to meditate. Uh, and historically, like in India, when um, aesthetics would go to caves to meditate, um, they would end up, you know, sort of um, making small shrines, uh, stupas, sculptures of the Buddha later, later on as a way to kind of like make an offering um, and to have something to sort of meditate on as they're spending their time in these caves. Um, and this started to get really popular. And so then, then people started putting money into cave shrines. Um, and then Buddhism comes to China. So um, there's already like a tradition of rock cut shrines in India before Buddhism even comes to China. So obviously somebody had seen these caves um, and shrines in India and said, let's do something like this in China, but like, let's go bigger. Let's spend more money on it. And this was a way for the emperor and the rulers to really show off their wealth and their power um, and to um, make a statement about their status and to make a statement about their, you know, devotion to Buddhism. Um, even if, you know, this is not really necessarily the way to make a statement about your devotion to Buddhism. This is what happens. So you'll see these really large sculptures of the Buddha, of bodhisattvas, uh, guardian figures. Um, you can see behind them uh, these relief carved uh, halos behind them, um, but the sculptures are three dimensional. I'm going to show you a little uh, video about the caves because they're really fascinating. These are the Longmen Caves. Among the familiar landmarks of early Buddhist art in China are the cave shrines at Dunhuang, Yonggang, and Lungman. Why were these sites created? Who were the major sponsors and patrons? Dunhuang was located along the Silk Roads at the far western edge of China. Merchants, local rulers, landowners, and travelers supported the local monastic community by excavating hundreds of caves along the nearby cliffs over a period of a thousand years. So it's an ongoing tradition. Like people even go there and give, donate money today. To Some patrons sought protection from the hazards of desert travel. Others wish to give thanks by commissioning statues such as these. Kings and queens were depicted bearing offerings. Many paintings and sculptures were created as a way to gain spiritual merit. The caves at Yunggang were begun in 460 by the rulers of the Northern Wei Dynasty. The Wei rulers and their families who commissioned these colossal Buddhas and other deities in fact considered themselves to be living Buddhas. Their exalted position promised salvation to the people they now ruled. This was political art on a grand scale. In 494, the Wei court started work on another set of caves at Lungmen. Several thousand caves were carved into the cliffs over the next 400 years. 
Processions of royal donors and their attendants can be seen on the cave walls. But inscriptions tell us that people from all walks of life contributed to the creation of these cave shrines. Some inscriptions proclaim the spread of Buddhism, while others speak of more personal wishes for the health and safety of loved ones, for ancestors, and for a happy afterlife. The largest shrine at Lungman was commissioned in the 600s by the Tang Dynasty Emperor Gao Zong. The central figure represents Vairochna, the cosmic Buddha who embraces all worlds past and present. It is believed that the features were modeled after Gao Zeng's empress, Wu Zetian, who later seized the throne. Get it, girl. Flanking the main figure are bodhisattvas, monks, and guardian figures. These are the guardian figures. And they're usually more, I'll show you some images in a minute. Visitors to the cave sites can appreciate the many circumstances under which early Buddhist art in Look China many was there produced. Are. Can you see how big and these how are? The remoteness yeah. of some of these sites has helped to preserve them over time. They're huge. So <laughs> these, okay, so these, this figure in the center is the Buddha, right? the Buddha figure. These are monks. The monks usually have shaved heads. Um, these are bodhisattvas, which you will recognize. Bodhisattvas are usually depicted with elaborate jewelry and crowns, right? Um, and then these figures over here on the right, uh, I want to call your attention to, um, because we don't really see these in Indian art. This is something that develops more fully in, in Chinese art and that all Buddhist temples in China have these guardian figures. Um, and if you look at the way the Buddha is depicted, you see that the Buddha is depicted as very like um, kind of restrained, frozen in time, um, kind of there's a sense of control. But the guardian figures, um, there are like soft curving lines and there's more of a sense of movement. Um, and these guardian figures are kind of scary looking, like they're meant to be sort of scary looking um, because they're supposed to scare away evil spirits to protect the shrine, to protect the temple. Um, and I think we saw something like this in the, um, in the um, museum. I think there was a guardian figure when we went to the uh, Pacific Asia Museum. Yeah, there was. Do you remember that? Yeah. He was a little red guy. He was um, in the Japanese section. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, but it, it really takes shape in, in China. I mean, you have them in Japan too. You have them in Vietnam. You have them in other countries. Um, but it really kind of develops out of um, like the Chinese mythology. Um, so the Long Men Caves, these ones um, that we're looking at here on the screen now, um, were commissioned by the Northern Wei Dynasty, um, a really powerful dynasty that ruled um, for, uh, you know, a couple hundred years um, in Northern China. And the one thing that I love about this is that um, the face of the Buddha is supposed to resemble this female ruler who seizes power. Um, so she has like, you know, supposedly, purportedly like commissioned the artist to depict the Buddha with a face similar uh, to hers. So you can see that like, um, in this instance, like the, like art is really being used as propaganda, right? So when Buddhism is brought to China, like it's a new thing, it's a new idea. It's a new concept, there are, there's new imagery, like and all of this doesn't really already exist in China, right? Um, and so this is an opportunity for these rulers to assert some kind of authority. Um, and I really think that this, the, you know, um, is a perfect example of this. I mean, can you imagine having a Buddha statue made and, and being like, I want the statue's face to look like my face? Like, <laughs> It's just like a really powerful statement. Uh, and you saw in the video this concept of like, you know, the Wei Dynasty, like basically, you know, thought that like, oh, we're bringing Buddhism 
to the people of China. Um, and so just like by the like wonderful joy of like being ruled by us, like they're going to be like in like, you know, good graces um, because they have the pleasure of being ruled by the Wei dynasty. Um, somebody has written something in the chat, let's see. An image. Um, let's see, did you see what's in the chat? Oh yes, yeah, this is a Japanese one. Um, new share. Guess what, I learned how to do a thing. Ha <laughs> ha, look at that, look at me, all right. Uh, yes, this is what we saw in the museum. So this is one of those guardian figures. Um, but yeah, there are some elements that like make it easier to identify as Japanese, but it's the same concept. They're kind of scary looking figures that are meant to scare away the evil spirits and protect the shrine or the temple. Okay, um, so um, here we see these Lung Men caves. Um, you can see they're carved into the side of this cliff. You can see stairways um, that connect them. Um, these limestone cliffs contain approximately like over a hundred thousand um, stone sculptures of the Buddha uh, and 60 stupas and a bunch of inscriptions and um, stone carvings. Um, and all of these are carved over like a period of 400 years. So it's not like, you know, one day they sat down and made all of this, but it's something that develops over time. Um, and as you saw in the video, it's not just um, emperors who are, so like the emperor, the Wei dynasty emperors are definitely making these huge gigantic sculptures. And like, I don't know if you can tell uh, by this image, let's see. Do I have an image with people? I don't know if you can tell, but these are gigantic sculptures. Um, they're really, really, really massive, huge sculptures. Um, but then there are also like, you know, smaller, smaller offerings that, um, you know, travelers, people who are traveling uh, along the Silk Road, um, local powerful leaders who would give money to have shrines built um, at some of these mm -hmm. caves. And so we're looking here at these videos from the Longman Caves, but you saw in the first video that there are like multiple, there are different sites um, in Northern China with um, these carvings in the caves. Let me show you one more short video. Buddhas on the cliffside, Longman Grottoes. This is the Yihe River. Can you see it all runs the, through the suburbs of the holes, ancient capital of Luoyang? All the, caves. the Longman Grottoes are one of the three largest grotto sites in China. You the see how huge Buddha that statue is? statue inside this cave was carved in the 7th century during the Tang Dynasty. More than 100,000 Buddhist statues were carved here over a 400 year period. The oldest cave dates back to the year 494, at the time of the Northern Wei Dynasty. Inscriptions on the wall around each Buddha statue explain why it was carved. During the early period, they were mainly carved for individuals. Then state carvings began. This seated Buddha statue was commissioned by Xuan Wu, the seventh emperor of the Northern Wei dynasty. The statue is made to resemble his father, Xia Wen. Buddhism was the national religion of the Northern Wei dynasty and its emperor was regarded as a reincarnation of Buddha. Hardly any new grottos were made after the fall of the dynasty in the middle of the 6th century. Grotto construction resumed during the Tang dynasty. Feng Xianxi cave was built in 675 on the order of Gaozong, the third emperor of the Tang dynasty. The Vairocana Buddha statue in the main hall is 17 meters high. It's believed the statue was built with a donation from the Empress Wu Zetian. There are statues of the Bodhisattva, Buddha's disciples, and other Vairodhara images around the central Vairokana figure. These are the guardian figures. They are regarded as the great masterpieces of Buddhist art during the Tang dynasty. As a Bodhisattva. About 60% of the grottos were made during the Tang period. Wan Fo Cave contains thousands of carved Buddha statues. Some are less than 10 steps.
Did it freeze? I think it did. Did the professor also freeze? <laughs> yeah, I think the um I think the video crashed her computer. Oh no, that's unfortunate. Oh wait, something happened. Yeah, I think she's fixing it. Collaborative support. Oh, okay, okay, it stopped. My computer is frozen. Hold on, let me let me see if I can do something. Let me close some, I don't know. This is my computer is like, what are you doing? Like, I don't know how to, let me close some things. Uh, my computer is not made for this kind of intense work. I think the school should give all students and teachers uh, free computers. That would be nice. I would welcome. I think, I mean, like my computer is like freaking out. Like it doesn't know how to do this or what to do. Um, okay, let's see if we can go back to it. Sorry about that. Uh, okay. Come on. Close this, okay. Uh, okay, so I just want to show you some more images from these caves. Um, this is the cave that supposedly um, the image of the Buddha here looks like the father um, of the donor who gave the money um, to create these caves. Um, so these are uh, sort of typical early Chinese Buddhist sculpture uh, in China. Um, we see the like typical manifestation of Buddhist art in China is in these caves. And the cave sculptures usually depict the historical Buddha, um, two monks and two bodhisattvas. So the, the monks are these kind of bald headed disciples flanking the Buddha. And then the bodhisattvas of course we know about um, are these, um, you know, enlightened beings who stay on earth to help the rest of us become enlightened as well. This error message keeps popping up on my screen. Are you seeing it too or no? No. No, you're not? Oh, okay. Like this, you're not seeing this? It's really driving me crazy. Um, okay, so maybe I can just move it out of the way. Um, so let's look at a close-up here of um, the, this specific sculpture uh, of the Buddha. And you can see the folds. If you look at the folds of the fabric, um, you see them sort of cascading over um, the body of the seated Buddha and this kind of like really graceful curving um, line of the folds of the fabric. Um, it's very sort of linear and very abstracted. And this is typical of the mature way style, which is what we're looking at here in 500, um, about the sixth century common era. Uh, and then you see the bodhisattvas flanking uh, the Buddha with these um, really, again, really elaborately pleated skirts. So you see the kind of fluttering edge of the fabric. Do you see this kind of um, swerving scalloped edge? Again, this is very typical. All of this abstraction and these the curving wavy lines are typical of uh, the way style. You see the figures um, have slightly um, smiling faces um, and elongated earlobes, which indicate their royal status, right? And they are, their bodhisattvas are usually depicted wearing crowns, scarves, jewelry. Um, so they're sort of, they've retained some of their um, riches, unlike the, the historical Buddha who has like thrown all of that off. 
Uh, here we see, this is a really interesting relief carving um, that's near the entrance to the cave that depicts the royal patrons visiting for the inauguration of the shrine. So like the shrine's carved, these big, huge, giant sculptures are carved. Um, and then um, at the entrance, this small relief sculpture is carved to depict um, the donor, um, you know, arriving for, you know, the inauguration ceremony with her, um, with her entourage. Uh, so we see again, sort of like the artwork itself and then an artwork about the artwork, right? Oh yeah, look, you can really see, um, you can really um, see some like good um, shots here. This is like a really high res image. Here's the monk. Um, so you can see the monks usually depicted um, with no jewelry, the bald head, um, and then the bodhisattvas are more elaborately dressed wearing sort of like, you know, um, fancy jewelry, fabrics, um, a crown, all indicators of wealth and status. And here's the guardian figure. The guardian figures, as I've mentioned, uh, are the, the way the bodies are depicted um, are more sort of curved, more curving lines. The, the Buddha figure is very sort of straight up and down, very still, very frozen, kind of transmitting a sense of peace and calm, while the guardian figures transmit a sense of energy. Um, and these curving diagonal lines um, create that sense of movement and energy. And they're more dynamic figures, right? Um, they're like, you know, the guards protecting the empress. Um, so the empress sits still and frozen, um, but the guards are in movement and in action. And you'll see this not just here at the Longmen Caves, not just in early Chinese art, but throughout um, Chinese art history. When we're looking at Buddhist art, we'll see the same thing. You can see that they originally were painted and there are traces of paint um, that are like, you know, pretty damaged now over the years. But they're in like surprisingly good shape considering um, how old they are. Um, and I want you to remember the guardian figure because we're going to talk about a contemporary Chinese artist when we come back from spring break, which I love contemporary Chinese art because there are so many really interesting artists who are doing um, some cool stuff, thinking about the relationships between the East and the West, um, thinking about art history. Um, and so in this figure, um, it, you know, you have to sort of um, be a little bit um, aware of Western art history, but basically you see a traditional Chinese garden figure holding up this head that's like a modernist, like a Western European modernist sculpture. Um, so I'll talk about Maiden Company a little bit more um, in the coming weeks um, when we come back from spring break. I really, really love this um, contemporary artist, Su Shen. So just this is a preview of something that we're going to talk about soon in the next, in a couple weeks. Um, and I wanted you to be aware of these guardian figures so that you would recognize this when we, when we talk about contemporary art in China. Um, okay. Um, the next um, topic that we're going to cover, how much time do I have left? Does anybody know what time it is? It's 12.38. Oh, you mean class is over? Is it? I don't I actually don't remember when class ends. What? That went by so fast. I cannot shut up. Okay. Um, I keep thinking like, oh, class is going to go by really quickly. I'll be able to do two lectures in one. And like, I don't know. I can't get through them. Um, okay. So I guess class is over. So I'm going to have to, um, you know, sign off here in a few minutes. So I guess um, I want you to study this the rest of this PowerPoint on your own. Um, I want you to look at this early painting of um, Lady Feng, who's defending the life of the emperor. Like, remember, I think you remember this from the first day of class, somebody acted this out. Do you remember this? Yeah? 
So there's um, a bear that had escaped, um, you know, from a zoo or something. It was coming to attack the emperor. You see two guards here and you see Lady Feng, um, the wife of the emperor. The emperor sits here um, and she puts herself in between um, the bear and the emperor, right? So this is really reinforcing Confucian ideas about um, hierarchy and like who is important in society, right? And of course, at the top of the pyramid is the emperor. So everyone beneath it has to be, you know, loyal to and obedient to the emperor. Wives have to be obedient to their husbands, children to their parents, etc. So that Confucian ideal is really um, illustrated here in this hand scroll. Um, and the, the hand scroll also sort of depicts kind of the ideal wife, like not just that she's willing to die, but that she's brave right, that she's brave and will protect the emperor at all costs, um, that she's loyal and courageous. Um, and I just wanna point out, I know, I know we gotta go, but the, this is a hand scroll. So it's something that would be unrolled um, and, it, and it would be read and, and looked at like a little bit at a time. Um, the, the same way that we look at a book, right? So it would be unrolled and it would be read from right to left. Um, with only a small section of it opened at a time. Um, and so you would roll this part up and open the next part and then roll this part up and open the next part. So you wouldn't really ever see the whole thing totally unrolled, even though this is, how long is this? 11 feet long. So it's nine inches tall, but 11 feet long because when you unroll it, it's this really, really long scroll. So we're just looking at one little piece of it. So you can think of it like a book with many pages. So this is, this is from a chapter that like, um, is a chapter like how to be a court lady, right? It's like a how-to guide of like, this is the ideal court lady that she's um, brave, courageous, and will protect the emperor. She'll be loyal to the emperor at all costs, right? I mean, this is what the emperor needs because if somebody has that much power, they're always gonna be susceptible to um, assassination attempts, right? So they really need loyalty um, because power is so consolidated. Um, so I want you to look through this and I want you to read through the six canons or laws of painting um, and make sure that you understand um, art from um, this time period. I also want you to review the art of the Tang Dynasty. This is the golden age of Chinese art when we see poetry, painting, um, ceramics, um, really all of the arts flourish during the Tang Dynasty. Like this is like, this is the golden age of, of Chinese art. Um, so I want you to review the rest of the slideshow. Um, this, is, this is something, this is the contemporary artist that we'll talk about after spring break. Um, we'll talk about Zhu Shen some more, but I want you to review all of this. I also want you to look at this image of the Bodhisattva Guan Yin. Guan Yin becomes like a really important figure in Chinese art history. Guan Yin is a Bodhisattva um, associated with compassion who helps um, bring people to heavenly paradise um, in Pure Land Buddhism. So I think I mentioned this to you at the beginning of our unit on China that there's a Buddhism sort of changes and morphs as it comes into China. Um, and there are different kinds of Buddhism, different sort of sects of Buddhism and Pure Land Buddhism is um, what sort of takes hold in China. And in this version, there's like a heavenly paradise. Um, and Kuan Yin, the Bodhisattva of compassion, um, is a very kind of nurturing, loving figure. Uh, sometimes depicted as female, sometimes depicted as male, sometimes depicted as sort of a gender, like without gender, um, or, you know, existing all gender, look, existing in all of these different categories. Um, but many times is sort of like a nurturing kind of mother figure, perhaps like akin to the Virgin Mary um, in Catholic iconography. Uh, and Bodhis the Bodhisattva Kuan Yin um, helps souls, guide souls uh, to this uh, heavenly paradise. So here you can see this in this um, scroll painting. Well, actually this is a silk painting. This is the deceased figure this is the bodhisattva and then like you know they're gonna surf on a cloud up together up to like heavenly paradise um and i just want to show you um one more thing i want you to read through this but this is a depiction of um sort of like heavenly paradise 
um, in Pure Land Buddhism under the Tang Dynasty. And just FYI, this heavenly paradise is exactly what the Tang Dynasty court looks like. So they would make their court, they would make their images of paradise look like their palaces, right? And they, the rulers would think of themselves as reincarnated Buddhas living on earth. And that being in the court, being associated with the emperor was like, it was like heaven, right? And it was your ticket to heaven. Um, so you can see that these rulers are really using Buddhism to um, consolidate their power and to, um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I hesitate to call it like propaganda, but like it kind of is, it's like verging on propaganda, right? Like they're using art. Um, to make statements about their power. Um, and, and that's not really just about religion and Buddhism, right? Um, so I want you to look through this. Um, I want you to make sure that you understand um, the imperial period um, and the intellectual life. I also want you to watch this video about the fisherman's garden. It will give you lots of flashbacks to the garden that we went to at the um, Huntington. Um, and this video, if it doesn't play in the PowerPoint, you can always watch it on um, Smart History on Khan Academy or smarthistory.org. I want you to read through um, this area where um, I talk about landscape painting um, and the scholar's desk. Um, and the art of calligraphy. Um, this is if you once the museums open again go to the Bowers Museum. They have a small but really beautifully done collection of Chinese art and this is in the Bowers Museum and it's a, it's a scholar study. It's a desk and the brushes and all the things that a Chinese um, calligraphy artist and landscape painter would have in their study. So you can go see this someday when museums open again. It's pretty cool. It's a pretty cool setup. Um, so I want you to look through this and make sure you understand um, these, you know, these kind of laws of painting um, and the different painting styles and themes and motifs that are important in Chinese painting. Yeah, cool. There's Kuan Yin again. This is this, the position um, that Kuan Yin is sitting in with the leg up is a position known as royal ease. This is the royal ease position. Um, okay, and then at the end of the slideshow, I just have like some recent discoveries from 2017 of a Liao dynasty tomb with some really cool paintings on the walls that, I don't know, they kind of remind me of quarantine life because um, the servants of the deceased are just like in the house, um, like, you know, doing laundry, folding laundry and like cooking and washing dishes. So I'm like, <laughs> this is my life right now. <laughs> it's like domestic scenes. So we see domestic scenes on the interior of this tomb. So I, I don't know, I think it's, it's sort of interesting. So please look through this um, and answer the discussion board on Thursday. And then I'll see you in two weeks, two weeks, um, because next week is spring break. And um, then we'll talk about modern and contemporary Chinese art. Cool. Anybody have any questions? Nope. Any questions? No? Okay. I miss you. I love seeing your faces. I hope <laughs> we get to like hang out in real life again, maybe someday. It'll happen. Just wait. <laughs> All right. Patience. Patience. All right. Have a good so, spring break. Um, have a good spring break. Thank you. Um, and I will post this recording on YouTube at some point. Let me see. There's a chat before I go in case there's anything important in this chat. Uh, hope everyone has a great couple of weeks. Okay, good. See you in two weeks. Bye. Bye. Wash your hands. <laughs> yes, wash your hands. Okay. Stop recording. Okay, bye.